I, I think we should begin. I'm Eric Wright, the director of the Haven Center for Social Justice. And I'd like to welcome you all to what is for us a, um, a new departure. Uh, the Haven Center was founded in 1985, named in honor of Jean Havens, a professor of what was then called rural sociology, now community and environmental sociology, who in his own life and career embodied the combination of activism and progressive scholarship that the Haven Center tries to promote. He was um, an active advisor for the Sandinistas during the Nicaraguan Revolution around issues of land reform and other matters. Uh, he died in 1985, and uh, just as this center was being formed, so we decided to name it after him. But in the intervening 30 years, <coughs> uh, time flies. In the intervening 30 years, I believe this is the first time we've directly organized and fostered an arts program, rather than our usual very exciting and intense encounters between progressive scholarship and activism. Uh, I increasingly feel that uh, the arts are a central feature of making even just the research and activism alive. And that these aren't really, uh, they are of course distinct activities, but they're not in distinct worlds and they need to cross-fertilize. Uh, and I'm, uh, I met um, Hector, must be three years ago now, right? That, uh, I guess. We, in, in a, for me, what was a completely odd circumstance to be in, that is, I was invited to an international arts festival, even though I don't do anything in the arts, uh, to give a talk on real utopias, which is my research area. And um, Hector was invited to the same international arts festival in, in, uh, in, Vienna, in Austria. And we met, and I was astounded by the work he does, its resonance with the themes that I work on, real utopias, how to bring the world we want in the future into the world in which we live, and how, as a sociologist, to treat that as a research problem, not just a speculative problem. Um, and immediately, I mean, I think, I think probably on that weekend, I said, I've got to bring you to the Haven Center. It was a more complicated thing to arrange, not just because Hector's schedule is complicated, he's flying all over the world doing workshops on the themes and issues that he'll be discussing with us, but because we wanted this to not just be him coming and telling us about what he does, we wanted this to also be a way for people in Madison would have an experience of collaborating with him in doing the kind of performance that he works on. Uh, and that just was more complicated than our usual visits. But finally we got it pulled together, which means that this uh, week will end, the, the culmination of his visit will be a performance at uh, Memorial High School, there's, there's an announcement that has been uh, circulated. We can pass, pass around the pile of announcements and so latecomers who get them as well. Um, <clears throat> on uh, Saturday at 7 p.m., uh, Hector is working with some students from high school in, in Madison who had been involved in a, uh, a trip to HBCUs in Atlanta. And I guess with some first wave students as well, who will be involved in this Madison UW first wave students as well. Uh, it sh and, and in addition to that, he'll be doing his own one person uh, performance uh, as part of the evening's activity. So I, I really encourage you to spread the word about this. Uh, the Memorial High School Auditorium is huge, so we can fill vastly more people than we're likely to get. But encourage people to come. Hector, um, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce your Aristizabal. Good. Close enough. Very good. So, uh, he's the founder and co-director of Imagine Action Theater, a nonprofit theater organization based in Los Angeles. Here's how the theater describes itself. And I'll just quote from their website. The work of Imagine Action Theater has been influenced by theater of the oppressed, playback theater, theater of witness, psychodrama, traditional storytelling, mask making, drumming, dance, and creative ritual. Through experiential workshops, theater performances, and other creative events, Imagine Action invites participants to explore embodied knowledge, challenge the inevitability of violence, and use their imaginations for a more just and joyous life for all people. 
in Southern California where it's based. They partner with community organizations for ongoing projects with youth and their families impacted by social justice, injustice. Hopefully by social justice in the future. Uh, he will be giving, uh, in addition to today's lecture, a second lecture tomorrow afternoon at the Red Gym at 4 o'clock in the Multicultural Center. And then, as I said, on Saturday evening, this uh, very special performance, both of his own work and the work he will be concocting with the students in the course of his visit this week. I give you Hector. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I was planning to make us uh, feel closer, and I ended up with this huge <laughs> empty, <laughs> empty space. So, and also because I, I was thinking that maybe later on I can show you more than talk to you about what I do. So, but right now I'm feeling really weird with this empty space. So can we like? So you want yeah, to just, yeah. Let's move closer. Spread it all out. Yeah. Because it's like, uh, and when we need to open, we'll open. Okay. <coughs> so, thanks so much, Eric, and thanks so much to Willie and all the people that made uh, this visit possible. And not only the visit, but also the, the possibility to, to share with the community and the high school. All right, we're okay then. We're close now. Okay. <laughs> I have a good now. We have the camera. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a lecture. I don't know how to do that thing. Uh, but I'm going to share with you a little bit of what I do and tell you all my work. And hopefully we can create a conversation. And we divided this into two parts. I used theater for many years as my way of activism and my way of being involved in the world. Is my art form, but it's also the best way I know to connect to people, to connect to others, and to engage in an exercise to transform the world. I, I think that the beautiful thing about a world that is collapsing everywhere is that wherever you look needs to change. So uh, the best way I know is uh, engaging communities in, and myself in using theater to imagine uh, the world that we want. Uh, for many, many, I grew up in Medellin, Colombia. Have you heard about Medellin? Very famous or infamous. <laughs> As I was growing up and going to college, like, like you guys now, uh, we were developing the cocaine traffickers, the Medellin cartels, which were entrepreneurial people who saw that there was a country in the north very interested in buying uh, cocaine powder. Uh, before that, it was marijuana. Our marijuana was very good at the time. Now, there's no comparison with the marijuana that we produce in the, in the United States. <laughs> uh, so now we no longer do that. And we uh, started exporting uh, probably the most successful uh, entrepreneurial adventure ever created in South America. There is nothing that can give you more return on investment than cocaine. Uh, it costs like $700 to create a kilo of cocaine. It produces minimum $70,000 distributed in the streets. And from that, only 35% goes back to Colombia. The rest stays in the streets of the United States, buying cars and paying hotels. And, uh, but you hear all the time to talk about the, the American mafia connected to cocaine. Not many. I mean, the DEA, the CIA, they bring them to the inner city. Uh, but that's another conversation. That we can talk about that another time. But anyway, so I grew up in Colombia, and especially in Medellin, when it became the most violent city in the world. We discovered this when we started the first uh, program of the study of violence, the epidemiology of violence, in the Antioquia University, where I studied psychology. And then we discovered, to our surprise, that Colombia was the second most violent country in terms of the amount of people that we kill every day. It was second only to Guatemala, that was, in, in that moment, in the 80s, engaged with the financing of your wonderful president, Ronald Reagan, uh, in the uh, financing of the killing of 250,000 Mayan people. In the meantime, in El Salvador, a very small country for a million people, said 65,000 people were being killed by the war. 
uh, Nicaragua and Honduras, etc. So, but Medellin in that moment was the, was the most violent city, uh, most violent than Beirut, most violent than the war that was going on in Iran, Iraq that lasted 10 years. So I was growing up in that uh, environment. And uh, when I was growing up, there were at least four or five armies that were looking for, for the young people like me. Uh, they used to recruit us as we play soccer on the streets, and they liked to look at the kids who were very aggressive playing soccer. So we were approached by the cocaine traffickers to become sicarios, paid killers. We were approached by the many leftist guerrilla groups that were recruiting young people for the revolution. And we were approached by the army. We had to serve the army. Uh, by, uh, we were obliged to, to serve the army at the time. And also, we were approached by the paramilitary death squads. Uh, so there was plenty of killing going on around. Sometimes we killed 25 to 28 kids a night. Imagine a city where that happens. So many of the kids that I grew up with were killed. And I always thought that my life was going to last maybe 18 years, maybe 20 years. Then I was lucky that I entered the university, the Antioquia University, it was the largest public university. And I began to study psychology because I was also very interested in the pain that I saw around me and included in my family. My youngest brother was gay and I, you know, I witnessed the suffering that he had to endure in the bigotry of the society because of his sexual uh, identity. And so he inspired me somehow to become a psychologist. And when I was in high school, I started doing theater. And I mention this because I felt that theater saved my life, literally. Uh, because when these groups that I just described were starting to sprout everywhere, I was doing theater. And theater and literature, I was also a voracious reader of literature, it allowed me to imagine that there was a life different to the life that I was witnessing around me, the life of my family. Um, and, and then I started doing theater in, in school. We, as most uh, theater groups in Latin America, we were all revolutionary artists. Uh, we, <laughs> we were all engaged in creating the revolution on the stage and, and, and educating the masses about how uh, through our Marxist analysis of reality, we were going to teach the obreros and the peasants and the students how to do the revolution. So it was a lot of fun, and it was a great way to, to meet girls. When we were <laughs> so that was also a very strong motivation <laughs> for me to, to do theater, which is something I didn't know existed. My parents never went to theater. They didn't even know that such a thing existed. And so, when I then uh, entered the university, I continued doing theater, and my theater group began to, to go to the festivals in Bogota, the capital. So theater allowed me to travel, and then to meet people from other countries, and to get exposed to people from other countries as well. So my horizons began to open up. Then at age 22, and I'm going to talk about this when I perform my play Nightwing, I was taken by the army and tortured. It was during the week of presidential elections in Colombia. So probably that's the only reason they didn't kill me, because there were international delegates, many people like progressives from Europe and the United States, who were witness to the electoral election in this country that was accused of some of the worst human rights violations at the time and for many more years. Colombia is still the probably the country with the worst record of human rights abuses in the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere, although we are considered the strongest democracy in South America, uh, because we are probably the biggest ally of the United States government. you know that country, the United States government? So we are one of the strongest alliances that the United States has in South America, where a lot of other countries are trying different uh, political uh, political responses to neoliberal policies. Do you know what has happened in, in Guatemala, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Venezuela and Ecuador and Bolivia, where the first uh, uh, indigenous man has been elected president? With all the contradictions, we had two, uh, three women uh, presidents in South America, 
Chile, uh, Brachelet, which has been elected twice, and then the president of Brazil, and the president of Argentina. <coughs> and so lots of interesting things are happening in, in Latin America. But as you notice, I am going to talk about theater, and I am talking about the scenario, the political scenario, because that's how we started doing theater. We were all very connected as well to the social and the political movements in, in South America. So in South America, we had like three very strong movements, theatrical movements, that were engaged in transformation. We had the Teatro Abierto in Argentina, where intellectuals created plays for the revolution, revolutionary plays. These were all inspired by Bertolt Brecht and the Marxist approach to, to, to theater. Bertolt Brecht used to say that we wanted to create a theater that allow the audience to bring the brain into the room, not hang the brain with the coat. Uh, and so when they watched what he called bourgeois theater, they could notice that what was being reflected there could be criticized, could be transformed. Not just we accepted that as the reality. But then in Brazil, we had Augusto Ball. How many people have heard of Augusto Ball? Okay, so a few of us. So maybe I can, I can tell you more because that's a big influence in my life. Augusto Boal developed the, what we call now Theater of the Oppressed, which is a, a huge methodology that I use a lot in my work now uh, in different places. And then in Colombia we have La Creación Colectiva, where we get rid of the director as the main person who directs everything, and the actors took the means of production of theater. And, uh, but we were mostly interested in how to create plays about our realities. Uh, so these were, uh, among other things, uh, the big three movements that developed in South America and influenced those of us, people like me, who were doing theater. So I did theater during my uh, college. And, and then in 1989, I really got tired of bearing friends. Um, Many people were being killed, not just leftist people, people, intellectuals, artists, poets, anyone who dared to think was being disappeared, <coughs> tortured, or killed in Colombia. And there was a moment in which I, I said, well, I'm waiting to be killed, but I don't even know by who. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we, after rehearsal, we discuss, okay, we should be trained uh, to be able to shoot guns, but when then we said, but who are we going to kill? And often the people, I mean, I'm not a killer. I, I prefer to make love than to think about going to kill someone. And, and so I said, well, I'm tired of this, and I don't want to die either. So I ended up, uh, I was working at the time in a clinic for drug addicts and alcoholics. It was the most expensive clinic in Medellin, so our clients were the bourgeoisie and the mafia. So I ended up connected to or meeting Pablo Escobar and the Ochoa brothers and Rodriguez Gacha, and attending the pilots that were bringing cocaine to, to the United States and then taking weapons to the Iran Contras. Do you remember Oliver North and, and the Iran Contras scandal? So I met some of the pilots that, as clients of mine. <laughs> I, uh, some of my clients were the people who worked for mass, muerte a secuestradores, the people who the mafia created a group to fight the guerrilla send the message that you're not going to kidnap us after uh, one of the Ochoa sisters was kidnapped in my university. <coughs> so I was having clients who were describing to me how they tortured people, and I had been tortured. So it became a very messy moment in my life. It became uh, very intense. We were really thinking that every day was our last day. So in that day we work, we make theater, and we make love with whoever we could find. And we talk about how to do the revolution. That was the, the way I was living my life. We slept three, four hours a day. Uh, but then I got a visa. I got a visa. This clinic sent me to the embassy saying that I was going to the United States to study English. So I ended up in Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> when I got there, I thought that I was in a movie set. <laughs> what is this? After all those cornfields and anyway, <laughs> so I ended up there, and uh, and three days later, in my sign language, I met the woman who became my wife for 13 years, 
And you know how love and sex get read very quickly of ideology and politics. No, <laughs> no, it's not. no I mean, no. It stayed there, but it was not as important at the moment. Uh, because I, what I realized, this was the last country in the world that I wanted to come to. This was the empire. This was the country I blamed for all the destruction and the oppression and the repression and the training of soldiers to become torturers. The School of the Americas, the oldest terrorist training camp in, in the world, that is located in Fort Bend, Georgia. And what they train is soldiers in South America and Central America in counterinsurgency. Now it's in counterterrorism. So I, I knew all of this uh, about these organizations. But then when I got here, I realized that most Americans had no idea what the role of the United States foreign policy was. So maybe I realized, maybe I'm here for something else. You know how the, the fate uh, brings you into places that you never think you're going to end up? And your job is to figure out why are you here, you know? To take the cards of your fate in order to find your destiny. You still need to, to live those cards. And so, and then I met uh, this woman and we, we got married, so I became official, so they gave me the citizen, uh, the American citizenship because I was making love with an American woman. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to do it. I, 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 I really recommend it. <laughs> I was going to do it through the torture survivors, but this was faster and, and much better. <laughs> and, but then I also realized that I could do lots of things for Colombia. And, and I could continue working uh, to protect human rights in my country. And uh, so, and then I started doing theater here. I went back to school because they gave me a BA for my degree in psychology. And uh, so I got an MFT in, in California. And I continue using theater. I have used theater more as a psychologist than in the, on the stage, even though I'm constantly doing theater. But for me, theater, and I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow, is also an incredible way of dealing with the psyche and dealing with the woundedness and the pain and, and transforming our lives through beauty. So but we will talk more about that tomorrow. So then in the last, uh, so I continue doing theater with communities and I met Augusto Boal in Omaha, Nebraska. Every year we have a PTO conference, Pedagogy and Theater of the Press Conference. I recommend it, it's a wonderful conference. So we met with pedagogues who were interested in Paulo Freire, the other amazing Brazilian that created this, the Pedagogy of the Press, where we said that everybody knows, not just the teacher, the student also knows, and knows a lot of things, and that learning is a dialectic process between the, those two people asking questions. And then Augusto Boal, uh, if, if um, Shakespeare said that, that the stage was a mirror of society, <coughs> And Bertolt Brecht said, let's be critical of that mirror and created the distancing effects for the audience to not fully identify with what was happening on stage, but to look at it critically. Boal created a methodology in which he said, if you don't like what you see in the mirror, you can come in and break it and change it. So, <coughs> which is foreign theater, which maybe I will show you a little bit of, the, of that uh, later on so you, you get the concept. So then uh, I continue doing theater. I, I work a lot with gang members in prisons in, in California. And I work with AIDS and HIV. My youngest brother, remember the one who inspired me to become a psychologist, he died of AIDS. He became a drug addict for, for some years. It seemed to me that it was easier for him to be called a drug addict than to be called a faggot. And, and, uh, and then he ended up contracting AIDS and died a horrible death at age 31. Uh, at the end of his life, it was only the bones and, and the protruded eyes. And so after that, I began to work with AIDS and HIV in, in uh, Los Angeles with the Latino community and did a lot of plays with them, plays about what they were going through. And, and they would take those plays to the community and create dialogue. Once I met Boal, then I started doing more foreign theater. And then, uh, remember Abu Ghraib, the photographs yeah. from uh, US soldiers uh, photographing themselves, torturing Iraqi prisoners, 
Iraqi, Pakistani, Afghan prisoners in, in this prison in Iraq. Uh, when I watched those photographs, yes, I, I got very upset, as I usually do when I see images of torture. It's not always in a post-traumatic way. But I got more upset at the reaction of the audience, of the people, the, of the United States. Oh, those are just a few bad apples. And I said, no, this is a sustained policy of the United States in many places in the world, for the United States Army and, and CIA, etc. So I decided to, to do an improvisation at a conference about torture that I was invited. And the reaction of the people was so strong that then I developed a play. And that's the play that I'm going to share with you on Saturday. <coughs> uh, as well as some work that we're going to create with the, with the high school students. So when I opened the chamber of torture, what used to be my personal nightmare, somehow the world came in. And the play changed my life. The play became this place where those three rivers, healing or therapy, art, uh, theater or my art form, and activism came together because I started traveling to, to, to colleges, universities, conferences, etc. And then I started talking about my work with, with kids and with clients, etc. And then I ended up letting go of my practice as a psychologist. And for the last eight, nine years, I have been traveling around the world, uh, working with communities uh, using this technique. So maybe that's a little bit of the history of how I ended up doing what I'm doing right now. So what I do right now is I go to communities. I mean, I also do trainings of people interested in doing this work. But I go to communities. I go a lot to Palestine, I, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, uh, Croatia, Northern Ireland. I have been going there for the last nine years and doing residences of one month working with both U, uh, UBF and UDF, the Ulster Defense Force and Ulster Voluntary Force, and the IRA. The, so the ex-combatants, uh, in bringing them together and bringing them together with their communities. There is a huge incidence of uh, suicide among ex-combatants. There is a lot of violence still among the young people who said to you, what the fuck happened with the, with the troubles in Northern Ireland? <laughs> they think that we are going to just accept these fucking murals and these fucking things, that's how they speak. I, I don't do it very well. But they think that the in Northern Ireland, down the wood. So, they, say, <laughs> so they, they, I tell them and these combatants, look, the young people grew up hearing about their heroic heroic ordeals of their fathers and their uncles fighting for, for Ireland, for the unification of Ireland. And now they don't have any initiatory process. So we need to give them some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, possibility. Uh, but tomorrow we'll talk more about theater and initiation, and, and working with youth, and etc. So, uh, so I work in these communities. and. What I do is I bring the techniques of theater, I work mostly with non-actors, which is a lie, because we're all actors. Every single human being is an actor. Every single child is an actor. If you look at a group of kids, they immediately start acting, telling their stories, transforming objects. If they have cars, they use the car, but if they don't have cars, they use the chew, they use whatever they want. They're using their imagination to transform the world and to tell us how they see the world. So I do that with adults. I do that with communities. I remind them that they already know how to tell stories, how to sing, how to dance, how to, uh, to use the symbolic language of this game that we call theater, which is simply a game with certain rules. And then we start creating scenes about their lives. So we create. Uh, uh, scenes uh, inspired by their lives, by their realities, and then we deal with the reality of the scene that they created and transform it. And then through a series of improvisations with the community, I, I create a play, a forum play. A forum play is a play that asks a question, does not resolve it. It <coughs> simply asks a question that the community or the group is interested in and then we take it back to the larger community, often I notice that the group is a symbolic representation of the larger community. So the issues that come out in that group 
are often of interest to the larger community, and then we invite the community to participate, to become aspect actors, not be passive spectators and applaud if they like it or not, but to become aspect actors, to look at the questions being asked on stage, not being resolved, and then they can come and replace the characters and try that something different. So it's not about finding the solution. It's not such a thing. I, if you are asking a question that could be that could be found a solution in, in 10 minutes, it's not a good question. But we create a, a dialogue that is aesthetic dialogue. It's not an ideological dialogue. As you notice, ideological discussions get polarized very quickly. But when you come and you replace a character and you put yourself in the shoes of the character and through empathy, you are now the bother woman, the woman that is suffering domestic violence. And when you are sitting, you say, what the hell is wrong with this woman? Why doesn't he just leave that asshole? But when you come and you become the woman and you see your kids, and you see you have nowhere to go, and you see this man that you love, although he also beats you up, it's not easy, isn't it? So it's, it's an interesting way for me to create dialogue and to, and to democratize not only the tools of theater, but to democratize the conversation. Because then the experts are not those who study or those with power, the expert is everybody. And the ideas come from everybody. In Los Angeles, I did lots of a place in high schools and junior highs and middle schools on bullying. And so we created lots of plays and we took them to assemblies and it was amazing the things that came out of the kids, the alternatives to how to deal with the bullying, uh, things that you would never imagine. I mean, I remember a kid once who, very small kid and the actors were big guys, Usually the Buddhist, you know. <laughs> so, and the kids say, I have an idea. And I look at this kid and I say, wow, what is he going to do? So he came with his little path, and then he came on stage. And when the guys came, hey, where are you from? What's up? And the kid just look at them, and then I see he pee, for real, in his pants. And then it was an assembly of two, three hundred kids. And some, very few of them laughed. But the rest were like this. And then I run to him and said, are you OK? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm OK. I said, wow. Uh, and you process the intervention. I said, what? what did you don't say, I did what I do. And they don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. And he was shaking, but he was so proud. And somehow, some kids, yeah, yeah. And then everybody started applauding. And I said, so I look around and say, uh, well, something to clean, that already someone was running, a teacher was running for a map, and they said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I have three sets of pants in my team. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> and he just left to change. So, I mean, the, the idea, there was another one, that a kid who just went crazy, he started screaming, Aah! and the guys were looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and he was like going crazy. And then the same, I asked him, what was that? I said, oh, I act crazy, and they don't touch me. <laughs> You know, so it's, it's uh, and of course, as when, do, when you crew a factor, they say, wow, let's, let's stage this in the next school. I said, no. No, because this work here, this were the resources of this specific place. Let, let's wait for what are the internal resources on the next place. And yes, yeah, sometimes it's frustrating because all, there are all the interventions of Mr. Kung Fu and all the interventions. The first intervention in almost any high school and middle school in the United States is the kid who comes and <laughs> and does that. I've never seen that any, in any other country in the world, except in the United States. It's the first intervention in, in every high school and middle school. Why? Because they are prisons. Today, I was taken to the high school. I was taken to a prison. The environment is a prison. So we are offending the children all the time, and then what do we expect from the children? They are upset. And then there are uh, cameras everywhere. And kids want to be seen, not to be watched. They want to be seen by someone who sees who is there, who sees the spirit in the child. So anyway, that's just an example of, but then the work that I'm doing lately uh, especially in Colombia, so I'm going back to Colombia now. 
and I want to move back to Colombia for the first time, I feel that. Because we have been, in the last four years, the government and the main guerrilla group, the FARC, the oldest guerrilla group in the world, it was born when I was born, uh, had been in negotiations, and it looks like we are going to be able to, to sign an agreement. But you know, peace is not signed in a piece of paper. Peace is signed in the hearts of every person. And so the work that is going to be started now after this agreement, the post-agreement, not the post-conflict, the conflict is going to continue. The conditions of the conflict are not going to change. Actually, most likely, are going to get worse. Because now violence is spread all over the place. Now we don't have the scapegoat, the guerrillas, or the, the aggressors, or the paramilitary, etc., <coughs> or the army. No, now the, the, the conditions of the conflict are felt probably by, by the entire population. But the work, I think that the, the theater has a, a, a very powerful role in bringing to communities a way to deal with this. So let me give you some examples. Uh, last year, uh, the FARC in, in Havana, where the conversation is, is, having, is taking place right now, there was a delegation of 10 people from Bojaya. I don't know if you've heard. Bojaya is a little town in, in Chocó, <coughs> in, in an area of Colombia that is in the Pacific coast. It's very undeveloped. Uh, it's mostly Afro-Colombian, the people who escaped from the Atlantic coast that were brought from as slaves, and indigenous people. So there's a lot of syncretism of music, etc., and cultural uh, between the Afros and the indigenous in this area. So there is an area in the Atrato River that has been trying to be used to create another a canal bigger than the Panama Canal. Colombia has so much water that they can create another larger uh, canal and destroyed a lot of uh, uh, land and, and pristine, etc. So, uh, so then uh, the, the paramilitaries took over a place where the guerrilla has been in control. And then the guerrilla came back with more, with a thousand men, and there was a fight, and the paramilitaries used the population as a shield. There was three petardos homemade bombs, homemade by the, by the guerrillas, thrown, and one of them fell in the church, in the atrium of the church, the atrium is something, El atrio, and killed 84 people. It was a whole, the worst massacre that the guerrilla has committed in Colombia. So 10 people from that community went to Havana, and the FARC asked them for a, for a private meeting and asked for forgiveness. They said that was terrible what happened there. It was not what we intended, it was a horrible mistake, blah, blah, blah. So they said, look, we are not, we can forgive you personally, but we cannot do that for the community. So they said, could you ask the community? So the, uh, an international organization called the OEM, okay, International Organization of Migration, asked me to, to socialize that question in the community. So with a group of psychosocial people, uh, we went to the community, and I did theater with the community. And we, so we had 65 leaders, 17 indigenous people and the rest Afro-Colombian. Some of the indigenous had been traveling for 24 hours in little chalupas to make it to the, <coughs> to the meeting. And some of them sold a chalupa full of plantains to buy the clothes to come to the meeting. So it was a big effort for a lot of them to just be in this meeting. And they were expecting a meeting. So I said, no, we're going to do theater. So people asked me, how are you pretending to do theater with Afro-Colombians who are constantly dancing and moving, <laughs> and the indigenous people who are very quiet? No, in less than an hour, they were all doing theater. And they were all playing. And they were all creating scenes. And what they did is that they transformed the question about forgiveness and said, okay, so the FARC wants to ask for forgiveness, but why are they still here? And why are they still here forcing us, They're displacing us, uh, sometimes disappearing us, harassing us? And what about the paramilitaries? And what about the government? They were involved in this massacre. The FARC threw the bomb, but everybody was involved, etc. What about the international community? What about el desfile de chalecos? The, how would you translate that? The desfile is what you do with the fashion parade. Parade. The, the, parade. the parade of chalecos of 
uh, jackets of the international community that come here, ask questions, do films, write books, and we, we're like, oh, you know, etc. So using theater, they transform the question in a life question. And then the question back from me was, what do you want? So these are all the complaints that we have, these are all the problems, the issues that we have, but what do you want? So then a lot of ideas came out of this process, and the last day, and I will talk more about this tomorrow, we decided to do a ritual, because they had just rebuilt the church where the massacre took place, and many of them had not come back there, because the government moved them one mile south, and these are communities that live around the river, but they built a barrio, a neighborhood, on bricks, on brick walls, etc., a mile from the river. So I uprooted the community, invested millions of pesos in creating this barrio, and washed their hands. So lots of difficulties, lots of problems, not involving the community in the main decisions, but governments and international communities and experts and anthropologists and sociologists, etc., making decisions for the community instead of engaging the community. And I'm not saying that theater is the only way to do that. Theater is just an amazing way to create a social laboratory to look for alternatives to conflict and alternatives to any challenges that people say. It's important to create place, to direct place, to write place. That's uh, absolutely important. But also theater is an incredible way to engage with the community in a creative way. So then, uh, after I left, they created a play and took the play with the question about forgiveness to different communities. It was amazing things because people thought that the FARC was coming. So they arrived to this community in the lancha, in the little boat, and no one was there. And the actors were like, what happened? And so finally one of them went into the forest, into the jungle, and started screaming that she knew someone. And then this lady came and said, what? I said, we're here to present the play. I said, no, the guerrilla is coming. So everybody's hiding. I said, no, it's not the guerrilla. We want to ask a question about what do you think about this? So finally everybody came from the forest and, and they did the play. And in December, indeed, this, this ceremony took place. It was a very intimate ceremony where uh, seven people from the guerrilla, the commandant of the guerrilla from that area came and asked forgiveness from the community. And they did another play about the issues of the community. So theater was completely a part of this process. Um, and right now, I just came back from Colombia two days ago, and I was working with a, what, what we call a, a laboratory using theater for reconciliation. So we had 20 people, five civilians, five military, five paramilitary, and five guerrillas. Do you know the difference between the guerrillas and the paramilitaries? Yeah? Mm -hmm. When the guerrillas, the leftist, Marxist groups that uh, have created armed uh, are, are men who want to overthrow the government, like what happened in Cuba with, with Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. Thing. The paramilitaries are dead squads, are people who are against the, the guerrilla, against communism, but are often people who are just paid mercenaries. Paid by who? By our transnationals, paid by the government, paid uh, often ex-military personnel, and in Colombia, they are accused of 73% of the massacres. In Colombia, they committed so many massacres and the displacement. So they come to a town like this and they say, you, 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 you. They put them in the center and they kill them in front of everybody. And then they use motosierras and they cut their bodies in pieces. And then they throw half of the bodies to the river and then they bury in, in common Fosas comunes in graves. common graves. Common graves. Common graves. Uh, so they have killed more than 90,000 people in Colombia. And Colombia, until last year, until last two years, with Syria, has had the largest number of internally displaced people in the world. Colombia, that is not at war. Our presidents never talk about it. The worst humans, uh, the worst uh, tragedy, and no president talks about it. Why? Who is benefiting from this? So of course when you, fought, so then 
they kill 20 people or 15 people or 30 people and they say, and you all have one day to get out of here. What do you do? You cannot even bury your father or your mother or, or your brother or whoever was killed. It's war. You have to escape with your kids, leave your animals, uh, leave everything, sometimes leave your grandmother who is too sick to walk and she said, I die here. And all these are the stories that I'm hearing now uh, while working with communities. So what, is theater useful for this? Some people might ask. Well, from all the things that I have done as a therapist and as an activist and as a person, theater is the, the way that I have known for my own personal life and for the work that I do that is the most powerful. Uh, and it has a lot, because it allows me not to tell people what to do, is to discover with people, to conjure our imagination, and try to see what can we do about this. Not just complain about, uh, although I do uh, uh, street theater, I go to Fort Benning, and we do giant puppets, and we tell the story about all the massacres that had happened, uh, inspired by the S graduates of the school, now called Winsick, remember? It was closed in 2000 because we had so much documentation of all the people that had been graduated from the school that had become uh, dictators and involved with the killings of the Jesuit priests in, in San Salvador and, and Monsignor Romero, etc., etc. But then uh, the government closed the school in December of 2000 and then January 2001 reopened it in the same place, with the same curriculum, they added some human rights classes and called it WINSEC, Western Hemisphere Institute of Security Cooperation. It's a mouthful of horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the school continued being the same thing. Uh, anyway, I, and I met recently a, a soldier that was there, and that was, he lost his leg, and he was in this project. And when I did my play, I mentioned the school, and he came to me and said I was there studying to be a nurse. But I know that other people were there studying to be a nurse. So it's not black and white. I mean, it's, it's a lot of different things. Uh, I would prefer now, I, this is, uh, so I, I have done these projects in, in Palestine, in, in Ukraine, in different places, Nepal. Uh, we, we had this horrible earthquake in Nepal, and we'll see you later. Ciao. All right. Uh, where 34,000 people were killed. So people are doing theater with these communities. I was there last year uh, working with them. And I was in Syria, in Gaziantep, which is in Turkey, the border with Aleppo, working with Syrian refugees and people working in Syria. And now they are using these techniques inside Syria, looking for alternatives. Theater doesn't tell you what to do, but when we start dealing with each other in a human way, telling our stories, it's a very different thing than just having opinions about how this should change or that should change. Uh, so that's more or less like a, a fast <laughs> uh, description of some of the things that I'm doing. I would love to, to engage in conversation. Is that OK? Yeah. So we can, uh, I have no idea what time is. OK, we're good. So any questions, comments? Arguments, good. Anything. Can you talk about your experience working with the Palestinian situation mm -hmm. and Israeli, and how you know, and, you know in, in your ongoing relationship with that conflict? Well, I have been going to Palestine for 12, 10, 13 years now. I went first with um, FOR, Fellowship of Reconciliation, when they used to take delegations there, <coughs> and Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb is one of the first women rabbis in history. And so she has been taking people to Palestine. And my work now is I go to Belin. I don't know if Belin is a very small village near uh, Ramallah. And they lost half of their land. They built a wall and took half of their land. And now there's these huge settlements that have been built in that land that used to be their uh, land with olive trees. So what I do there <coughs> is uh, I bring internationals who are interested in learning how to use these techniques. And, <coughs> so, and we do theater with the community. And we develop a play of things that they're interested in. I don't bring the play with me. 
it grows from the improvisations. And also, I, this last time, I brought a muralist um, from, from L.A., uh, Francisco Letelier, who is the son of uh, mm -hmm. Orlando Letelier that was killed in Washington, D.C. by a bomb. He worked for the Allende government. Remember Salvador Allende? September 11, 9-11, 1973, when Salvador Allende, the first ever elected president, uh, socialist president, we have a socialist candidate in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I feel the burn. So possibly, <laughs> it's burning. Okay, but so, so uh, he was killed by the CIA, and, and Pinochet was installed in Chile, a dictator. Uh, so, what was the question? Ah, in <laughs> so in Palestine, so I, uh, I brought that muralist, and I also brought puppets. So we created giant puppets because. For the last 10 years, every Friday, they do a demonstration against the wall. And the Israeli uh, army throws $50,000, US dollars, in just gas and stun grenades. They have machine guns for gas. Uh, and this is not just gas like the Mohino. This is nerve gas. I've been there. You cannot breathe. It's horrifying. Uh, several people have died because you're, you cannot you, you cannot breathe. And it's, it, it's clouds and clouds of gas. Uh, it's very dangerous. It's a very difficult place to be. Uh, you see the oppression of, of the daily occupation. It's a horrible, horrifying situation. But the idea for me is not so much how to protest, but what is it that we can do. So what I offered was, it was the olive harvest. The olives are the most important thing for Palestinians. The uprooting of the olive trees is one of the most painful things I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, and then so we do puppets. And this time, with the puppets, they became like these protective shields. And we were able to reach the soldiers. And they haven't been able to do that for many, many months. So they were very happy. And then we were able to walk to the wall. But then they start throwing the stun grenades, the sound grenades. They threw one at my feet. Uh, I, I don't know how I, I was able to jump. When it exploded, I had a pain in my chest for five hours. Good. Your body contracts with the explosion. Uh, fortunately, nothing happened. But, but it's my, my, my work there is, and I work with Israeli activists, there is a lot of activism in Israel, a lot. But, but they no longer work together. Mm. Uh, for, after Camp David, and, they, they, they said they don't want to normalize the situation because their situation is so different. So they want Israelis like combatants for peace. There are so many beautiful, amazing organizations working inside Israel to, to end the occupation. And, and then I work, so I work in both sides, but with Israelis, about Israeli and uh, Israel and, and Palestine, but mostly in Palestine. So my work is to bring these tools. It's, I mean, I cannot find the solution. I don't think it's an easy one. But I feel that our job is to find a third way. It's not this or this. We have this polarized world. What art does is find another way. It's like mythology. It's the third way, the charm. It's something that will embrace this and this. It's not the paramilitaries or the guerrillas or the army in Colombia. It's how we have enough imagination to imagine that the other has life. Um, what is your feeling about the power of theater that has no words uh, versus theater that has words in your experience? I, I tend to use uh, images because images are polysemic. And do you know what? The best way I can answer that question is by doing it. Can we do it? Uh, can we? Can you get up? Let, let's do a simple. We're going to do the shortest play in the world. I can show you. I can show you uh, the mechanism of form theater and, and images. Okay. So we're going to. And um, freeze. What do you see? What do I see? No, they, they. What do you see? The world of people meeting. What else? They're, they're looking at each other. What else? What else? Connected. Who are these people? My friends. Two individuals. What else? And what do you see? What do you see? A man and a woman. What else? Um, no movement. 
What else do you see? Who are these two people? Two people from uh, two different countries. What else? Strangers. What else? Friends. What else? Etc. Yeah? <laughs> so, we noticed that we didn't rehearse. We created the simplest image in the world, a handshake. And then we project different things. We can see friends, enemies, and the other way. Friends, <laughs> enemies, uh, two people, uh, a peace agreement, depending on where I am, people start projecting. If I am in prison and she is a man, then they would say it's a drug deal. <laughs> uh, they are gay, uh, etc. Yeah? So for me, it's interesting what is projected in the image. The image is polysemic. And what people see, we tend to see a lot of where we are. Yeah? What would happen if, can you stay there, please? Can you just hold it? What would happen if I do this? What do you see? Uh, Oppression. Benediction. What else? Deference. What else? Knighthood. What else? Projection. What else? Asking for forgiveness. What else? Nature. A power differential. Etc. <laughs> so notice that the same image can even hold the opposite. We can see a knighting and we can see humiliation. We can see, yeah, all kinds of things. And for me, as a facilitator, I'm interested in what gets projected. Yeah? When I did this in Afghanistan, uh, he's about to be beheaded. And uh, a German uh, person has been just beheaded by, uh, by Al Qaeda. So it's also where I am. Yeah? Where I am. So, but now, my dear, let's go back. I'm going to create <coughs> a conflict. But there is no theater without conflict, there is no life without conflict, there is no growth without conflict. The problem is that we associate, especially Americans, conflict with violence. Right? Yeah. If we have conflict with someone, we don't have imagination. Let's just nuke the hell out of them. <laughs> and it's done a lot. Oh, conflict with terrorism! War against terrorism! And we become the biggest terrorists in the world, if you ask half of the world. Anyway, so, now I'm going to add conflict. And freeze. What happened? You rejected it. What else? No diet there. What else? Track. What else? She's frustrated. What else? Murder. What else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, my dear. Uh, notice the image, yeah? So, uh, notice that I added, and we see, again, we see different things. So now, if, if this is a foreign theater, we created a conflict. So the two of us are going to reach hands, but this character rejects the other one. What was her reaction? What was her reaction? Stun? What else? Or stop? What, what else? Confusion. Her, confused. Her facial expression didn't change, so it's yeah. kind of like a difference. Indifference? Etc. What well, is this the only way to react to this? No. She reacted in one way. Okay, so my dear, I'm going to ask you to please do this character. Mm -hmm. Pretend you're going to give your hand at the last minute. Anyone else has another idea of how to react to this issue? We have a problem now. Yeah? Is that a problem? Yeah? Yes. So one okay. So who has an idea of what how else could this character that wants to connect and is rejected, how else, what else could he or she do? Anyone? You have an idea? Yeah, your body does. I love it. <laughs> when your body moves, I believe in that part of you. So, and there are no mistakes. In this world, there are no mistakes. We look at it. Yeah? So, my dear, you are playing this character now. Okay? And one, two, three, action. And freeze. And freeze. What is she doing? How did she react? She's confused about what to do next. Confused about what to do next. Isolated. Isolated. Offended. Offended. Lost. Lost. Sad. Sad. She's showing us the emotion. Yeah? She reacts. She's thinking. She doesn't know what to do. She's etc. So also her intervention becomes a seed for other, because we are there watching the character and say, why doesn't she do this? Why doesn't she does that? 
she could do this, you know? So there's no wrong intervention. It becomes a seed, an idea for other potential. So thank you. And now, my dear, can you play that, that character? Anyone else? What else could this character do? <coughs> Anyone? There are no mistakes. This character wants to connect and is not being able to. And this is a very simple, yes, please. <coughs> and go, quickly. And one, two, three, action. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm freezing. Okay. So, so uh, what is she doing? So we process the intervention. Of course, we do a play. It's not this simple, but this is an anti-model that allows me to explain the principles of foreign theater. Uh, so, <coughs> what is she doing? Insisting. Insisting. She did not take it that personal. She <laughs> wants what she wants. She went. Forgiving. forgiving. She's forgiving. Trying harder to connect. She's trying harder. She's not giving up. But She's mad also. Yeah, but she's going for it, etc. Huh? Sort of like she's disarming. sort of disarming. Okay, very good. So, my dear, now you see it. Thank you. And now you play this character. Okay, the last one. Anyone? I want you to really go for what you want. Anyone? Ah, there was another one. You. Come on, yes. Okay. So, the same play. One, two, three, action. <coughs> <laughs> I'm free, <so> okay. <laughs> so often we train the antagonist, she's the antagonist, uh, to not make it so easy. She has her own reasons why she doesn't want to connect, and we could start creating stories. So, what happened to this character? Etc. But what did she do? Insisted. She insisted. She was persistent. She was what? What else? She was very direct. Huh? She was very direct. She was very direct. She was assertive. Yeah. Like, okay, uh, it's okay. So notice is so we start the form. Is there a solution for this? This is the simplest thing in the world. Is there a solution? Leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, so the point, okay. So my dear, can you please do it again? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> stay there. So again, it also depends who I'm working with. So often, I sometimes use this or others to introduce the work to high schoolers. Because usually the first person to come is, so, Tan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or this. Or this. In the United States. Never seen this anywhere else in the world. Yeah. So when someone does that, there are the 300 kids laughing. <laughs> There are all the teachers. <laughs> no? There is the principal looking at me like, what are you doing? So I come and say, wow, man, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to shoot her. I said, why? I said, because she dissed me. She disrespected me. I said, and you're willing to kill her? Yeah, man. So I asked, what is going to happen to him? He's going to prison. He's going to be killed. Oh, so the kids start throwing things. So you're willing to go to prison or to be killed for this. Yeah, man. So you don't give a fuck? So I use this. So I said, you don't give a fuck. And then again, <laughs> you see him? He said fuck. And, and now the teachers are really like, who broke this clown here, man? They are really pissed off. So, but I need to quickly tell the kids that I'm not here with the administration, that we're going to talk shit. Yeah? And usually it goes very fast. And sometimes when they just really said, you want to cuss? I said, really? Yeah. Say, OK, we're going to cuss for one minute. Ready? OK, motherfuckers, ready, go. <laughs> 30 seconds. Fuck you. Asshole. They, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Say, you guys are not very good. <laughs> you know, et cetera. And then, but you get a lot of heat. So don't do it if you don't feel comfortable with the heat that you're going to get 
especially from the principal and the teachers, etc. <laughs> but now the kids are somewhere else. So I said, so really, can we really kill someone for this? What kind of society are we in that this is allowed? And then, of course, and then there's the Kung Fu thing, and there's, but after a while I said, okay, this is it, man. And now maybe another kid will start doing this, maybe another kid will start doing this, if I am in India, someone does this, yeah? No one he ever here will do that, but it's also cultural, yeah? Thank you. So, my dear, this answered your question a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm more interested in images because they are polycentric. Because they allow us to project many different things. And through the images, we start safely, in a playful way, conjuring the wisdom in the room. Not what I think, which is usually worse and more limited that way. Take, take care. Thank you. Don't worry, John. <laughs> uh, not the, yeah. Do you teach this? Are you training people? I, I do, yes. I do also trainings. And often when I do train, I do a lot of trainings in Europe. It's very interesting. In Europe, lots of people are interested here. In the United States, some people are studying this in school, in college. But not many people are using it. So we studied, I don't know for what, <laughs> like most of the education in this country. It's complete abstract thinking. It's an ivory tower. We're consuming education as fantasy. You know the difference between fantasy and imagination? Fantasy does not awake your deep self. Fantasy makes you a consumer, and there is lots of fantasy. All the kids are inundated with fantasy in their little screen all day long and it makes you a consumer. Imagination connects to who you are. We have very little imagination in this culture. Very little. So for me, what I, the work is about creating a space for imagination. Not for my imagination, it's everywhere I go. Like this week, if any of you are interested, please come. You are all invited. To, <laughs> to the project with the high schoolers. We only have three days to create something and then show it to the larger community in that beautiful theater, a huge theater that we need to fill with something <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> so come to see the performance, but if you want to see this work in practice, I'm going to do it with these uh, young people who just visited some black, uh, historical, historical black, black, colleges. black colleges, and I want to see what they learn, what questions came out, will come out of them from that experience, and then we will create something. What? I have no idea. That starts out, the, you're working with the students starts Thursday? Thursday at 4.30. Thursday at 4.30 at the high school. The high school. Ah, no, 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 where? Yeah, Thursday it's at the high school, yeah. So we can, um, if anybody's interested, right after this we can talk. Excellent, yeah, yeah please, Thursday. thank you. If you want to see how this works, because, uh, yeah, I will be, and it's all through playing, it's all through games, it's all through exercises, it's always playful, it's always joyful, it involves uh, the body. Images, we start always with images. Um, and then, and maybe on, on uh, Saturday I'm going to also show the power of images. Because also, not one person is, is uh, responsible for creating the image. We all participate. Uh, and I will show you a little bit more of that, but any other you, comments? You had your hand up at one point. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Because you're in my back. Yes, I no, need I, to go. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, well, I brought my um, class on um, black women in art and visual culture, oh, and part of um, what we are doing, are, and I would, and it's such a joy to hear about pedagogy of the oppressed, especially yeah, given the moment of it. the university oh, right now and things oh. that are happening. And, um, so I guess my question would just be kind of, um, for those who, uh, I, I have some uh, really gifted organizers in my class, and uh, part of our final project is to challenge them to create um, something that they can bring to their communities. So my question would kind of be about method. Um, what are the ways, and I guess this also has to do with kind of your work with the high schools, but, uh, but um, in your um, work with community organizers and um, actors, activists, what would you say is a method for creating or in your process? Is it like, I guess, I know that it's organic and it changes, but if there was kind of, if we could peek into your playbook of 
expertise of working with activists for all these years and working with social movement and social justice for all these years, um, <clears throat> would there be kind of a guiding principle in terms of how you are able to kind of um, access, um, I don't know, access and uh, access and produce kind of these projects of radical love and I don't know if there's a, a something that oh, you I like can... that I want to read that principle <laughs> radical love <laughs> I, I mean I work with games okay I always play uh, regardless of who I am with and and games are simply ways to connect through rules there's no game without rules uh, like a uh, tag. If I touch you and you don't follow me, you cannot play. <laughs> 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 All right, so, and me. then you start <laughs> creating more and more sophisticated games. Um, and within the constraints of the game, you find the freedom. With organizers, a big problem, I work a lot with many leftist groups. Many, many. And, and when I arrived to the country, I was connected to all of them, you know. And then I realized, and I was invited to talk about Colombia, and blah, blah, blah. And then every time I got up, I said, like, everybody had white hair. <laughs> like, everybody was above 50 or 60. And the only young people were the paid staff. <laughs> and I said, have you noticed that we have not been very successful at convincing anyone? <laughs> have you noticed how ugly we look? Not because we're all and gray, it's the attitude. <laughs> we were all very serious about changing the world. I say, who are you going to seduce like this? <laughs> who? I mean, if I come to this room, I run away. <laughs> the same happened in all the places where I work as a therapist. I say, I will come in the morning and say, if I was a kid, I would run away from this place. What an ugly place. Because it was, everybody was like, so how can we heal and transform if we are not offering anything, if we have no imagination? Because to complain about things is the easiest thing in the world. To say no to Obama, no to Bush, no to Trump, no to whatever, no, no to war, no to torture, is simple. And it doesn't give you a lot of power. I think it gives the power to the other. Okay. My invitation every time I work with any group is, what do you want? If we don't want this, what do you want? And we can use painting, we can use mandalas, we can use... Uh, creative writing, spontaneous writing, we can use theater, my biggest tool is theater, we can dance together, and we can do what children do. They recreate the world constantly. You put a group of five-year-olds and they teach you what to do. And all of us, any human being that I know, in any culture that I have visited, learn to walk, to crawl, to talk, to socialize, play. So the, the biggest in my opinion, the biggest quality of a teacher and a therapist and an organizer is curiosity. Uh, and in the word curiosity is the word cure. You know? mm -hmm. Is to really, know, and paradoxical curiosity, as, as, what's his name, from the Lederach, John Paul Lederach, uh, as he said about, the, is that we know that we don't know. And you really go to a community to learn, which is the same in pedagogy of the press, is to learn what is there. What are the internal resources in the place where we're working? What I try to do when I go to a community is how to reconnect to the roots of the imagination of the place that are often broken by violence and murder and war. But the communities have ways to come together, have ways in which they used to go to the river and make the algos, the chocolata, the... So how do we recuperate that? How do we recover the river? So tomorrow I'm going to talk about the, how we design rituals with communities based on their own mythologies and cosmologies and, and ways of coming together. So the best way to organize this also is that you have to go and be there. You don't bring these great tools from the sociology department at Haven Center <laughs> to the... They are useful and not very useful. They are good for you to keep you grounded. They are good for you to go back to. And maybe they are good for you to write the paper for the teacher. But <laughs> if you really want to be in the community, just be there and see how they organize. 
what is the net of connections that they already have that you need to learn? So you need to, to identify who are the leaders, who are the, and the most unexpected things which are for you. Uh, is the, all the different beautiful ways in which communities are woven together. And what we do is we make visible the invisible. We, and theater is the way that I, that I, that I know best. Um, but yeah, so organizing is become part of it and see what is already happening there. Because we come with the salvationist uh, ideas that we have the formulas. I mean, I hope that doesn't happen anymore, but that we know how to analyze. Remember when I started doing theater, we think, we thought, we knew how to teach the union leaders how to do the revolution, please. <laughs> but um, I feel that we transform transforming that transforming ourselves, that we heal, healing ourselves. All the work that I do is to heal myself. And for me, this returning to Colombia now is, is like uh, doing the, how do you call that? The full circle. The, the full circle. Because last week, I did my play to these 20 victims. And there were paramilitaries in the room. And there were militaries in the room. And I had been working with them for, for these last three months. And then one of the paramilitary women, she left after the play. The next day she was sick. And when I was saying goodbye, she came back. And she said to me, listen, you made me cry for the first time in many years. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I got sick. And I have to tell you, I did what was done to your brother, to other men. And I killed him. And I tortured them because I thought they were less than human, because they were guerrilleros, because they were horrible people. And you made me realize that they were someone's brother like you, someone's father, someone's son, someone's human being. And I thank you for that. And I don't even know why I'm telling you this because I'm shaking. So I said to her, look, I have also killed you many times. And you, and you, and you, I told the people. And then I was sitting next to a, to a soldier, and I said, and I hated you and your institution because you tortured me and you didn't have anything against me. But by dehumanizing all of you, I was dehumanizing myself. So I have had to do a lot of healing and reconciliation within myself to be able to now be with all of you and see you as this woman that you are, a mother, and that's why she left the movement, uh, etc. Uh, and the price that the soldier paid to lose his leg to a landmine. And, and this that we're doing here is what the whole country has to engage in right now. And what we're doing here with theater is creating a laboratory to see what would have to ha happen. So we really understand what the reconciliation and forgiveness and truth will mean for us. And, and I think in the United States, we haven't done that. This is probably, the, this country was, was born with the, with the massacre, the genocide of the indigenous people, and we're still killing them, with the slavery of the Africans who were forced to, to build the country. We still have slaves. <laughs> she paid labors. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a lot of consciousness, not even about the wars in which we had sent our young and brave. You know how many commit suicide, how many combatants commit suicide in this country? Yeah. 28? 22, 22 a day. A day? 22 young heroes commit suicide. How? Are they really heroes? Or how are they feeling? So, I work with a, a project called the Soldier, the, the, wow. the soul in the soldier, that which never comes back. And it's about hearing their stories. PTSD for me is a story that has not been told and has not been heard.